Hi everyone, I thought I'd start today's video from my garden so you can see my pretty fountain and it looks lovely. It's a beautiful spring day and so I thought I'd start the video out here in the garden and I'm going to go in. <laughs> um, but today the video is really special and um, so I just wanted to start in a tranquil, calm little corner of my garden um, because I'm excited about today's message, today's, today's video. Um, it's been a long time in the making. Um, this is a, a message that I've wanted to bring since about November. Um, and I was going to do this as a, a message that I presented to the church, to my local church. But it just seemed that the timing was never right. Um, just didn't seem to ever be right for me to present it to the church so this is something that's been on my heart that God's put on my heart that I wanted to share because it's such a beautiful beautiful message of love from Heavenly Father to all his children and I thought it's Easter now's the time um, with all the things with coronavirus going on and the sort of fear of the world that we're living in at the moment. I thought this was a perfect time to do this video. So I just say hello from my garden and enjoy this beautiful message. Okay, so this message is about a hidden prophecy, such a thing sometimes known as a type or a shadow, um, from Jesus, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, found in Psalm 22, that will hopefully blow your mind and lead you to praise God like a crazy person, because it did me. <laughs> um, okay, so where to start? Psalm 22 is a prophetic scripture written by David that tells of Jesus' crucifixion a thousand years before it actually happened, seemingly from our Lord's perspective. Um, there are many similarities in this text with later accounts in the New Testament of the crucifixion of Christ. This psalm is a well-known foreshadowing of the death resurrection and look at the far future return of Jesus and many studies have been done on it so I recommend to you all to do your own studies on this psalm um, because it's just amazing and it will lead you down a rabbit hole <laughs> that's all I can say um, so first of all um, I'm gonna actually read Psalm 22 to you first Okay, so I'm just going to stop here for a second and I'm going to come back with my Bible and I'm going to read Psalm 22 to you. Okay, so I'm going to read from Psalm 22. For the director of music to the tune of The Doe in the Morning, a Psalm of David. 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. 2. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and I'm not silent. 3. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. 5. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. 6. 
But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. 7. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. 9. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. 10. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. 11. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. 12. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. 13. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. 15. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, whatever that is, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. 16. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. 17. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. 18. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. 19. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. 20. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. 21. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions, save me from the horns of the wild oxen. 22. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation, I will praise you. 23. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honour him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. 24. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. 25. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfil my vows. 26. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation, nations will bow down before him. 28. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. 29. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. 30. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. 31. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. And that is Psalm 22. How amazing is that? Okay. So what I absolutely love about this psalm is the echoing, the foreshadowing, and how you can see prophecy, which is what is being presented here in this psalm 22, um, how you can see it being fulfilled in the New Testament scriptures um, which tell of Jesus's life, death and resurrection. And so for example um, Psalm 22 opens in verse 1 with the familiar words that Jesus cried out on the cross of my God, my God why have you forsaken me? In the New Testament, in both Matthew 27, 46 and in Mark 15, 34, the writers recorded that Jesus indeed cried out these words. So 
So we can conclude here that while Jesus was dying an absolutely agonising death after being beaten and I mean real you know whipped with the barbs and beaten and I mean he was he was dying and he was in agony and yet he took the time to call out to God but quoting from Psalm 22 I mean you know I find that absolutely amazing you know um, I remember this was written Psalm 22 thousand years before Jesus so when you think about all the other the other the other things in there that, that point to 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 Jesus you, you just have to study it yourself okay yeah so you're probably thinking um, where's this beautiful message of love that you said you were going to bring. So, okay. This is what I want to draw your attention to. Um, it's the use of one little word in Psalm 22, 6 of the worm. But first I want to ask you a question. This is the question. believe the word of God. Um, Proverbs 30 and 5 says that every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. That's the KJV version. Uh, the NIV says every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And the ESV says every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So there's three different versions there. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is flawless. Every word of God proves true. Various translations, they use the word pure, flawless and proves true to describe the word of God. And it also says that we should trust in him or take refuge in him. So... Okay, so obviously I'm wearing different clothes, it's another day, um, I did actually go off and do other things and, and ran out and didn't finish, so I'm going to jump back in, um, I was talking about Proverbs 30 and 5, um, talking about um, how every word of God is, is, is pure, flawless, proves true, however you, whatever you, translation you want to use. Um, Hebrews 4 and 2 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So, <clears throat> scripture tells us that the word of God is alive. Um, who? Who is the word made flesh? Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. With the same breath that God gave us life, he gave us language. Language, what we say, it matters. It's important, it's powerful, and equally what we do with it. It must be because God saw what mankind did with it and he wasn't happy, so he confounded it at the Tower of Babel. So, and then with an imparting of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, 
I gave the gift of speaking in tongues. I just thought, you know, that the word of God is the most powerful use of language ever. You know, it's our way to come to know our God. Um, I'm just reading from my notes here. <laughs> You're wondering what I'm doing. Um, so if you want to know God intimately, you have to first believe everything that comes out of his mouth. His word in the Bible is true. Simple as that, right? In other words, you can trust that everything that God says is true. And there's a reason for everything he says. It's there for us, to protect us, to keep us safe in him. So let's look at an example uh, from Luke 5. 1 to 7. I'm going to do that reading now. Luke 5, 1 to 7. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Take the Lord at his word and you will see miracles. So as you can see in this example that when Simon took the Lord at his word, listened to what he said, believed in him, trusted him, a miracle happened. When you really dig into the word of God, when you believe that everything he says has a purpose for you and your life, things, miracles even, will happen in your life. So do you believe the word of God? I'm just putting that out there for you to mull over in your own time, okay? <laughs> so, what am I saying here? I'm saying you need to look carefully at the Word of God. Because every word God has used is important. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, um... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Um, and Matthew 5.18 says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Okay, so let's get back to the Crimson Worm, um, Psalm 22.6. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. Why am I focusing on that? It's a strange verse. What on earth does it mean? Um, well, we've established 
that the whole of Psalm 22 is a prophetic scripture. And here we have an example of what is called a remez. remez. Um, it's a Jewish way of interpreting scripture. It's like a hint or a signpost. It reveals a hidden message or deeper meaning below the surface or behind the words. Like buried treasure. So this is why it's so important to really dig in to the Word of God um, and try and, and, and get in there and unpack it. Um, so God inspired David to write Psalm 22. It's God letting us know what he's going to do for us soon uh, in a thousand years at the crucifixion. People often say that Jesus here is comparing himself to a lowly worm to be somehow modest. Um, but I don't think that that's the full picture. What is he really saying? Well, let's look a, at this worm a little closer because it's absolutely amazing and fascinating. So I'm going to just put up a slide for you now just to explain what this worm, start to explain what this worm really is. So apparently this word, um, tola, tola at, or tawala, um, is a specific worm, a particular species of worm, which is more like a grub that is found in the Middle East. Um, its Latin name is Coccus elysis, which is fascinating, I'll get back to that later. Um, but in ancient times it was used to make a crimson or scarlet coloured dye and that is really fascinating, I'll get back to that a bit later. But usually, apparently, the usual word for worm that the Hebrews used in scripture was rima. Rima. Um, a kind of maggot. Um, a very different kind of worm. Um, usually in, in the Bible they're bad creatures. Um, things like maggots, tapeworms, canker worms, um, obviously another creature that you could bundle in there with locusts. Um, not nice worms. Okay, so um, as you can see from that, uh, Mark 9.48 says, The worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Um, speaking about hell, yes, I think we can agree with that. Um, in Joel 2.25, um, you've got the four different worms kinds of worms it says in the King James version and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm my great army which I sent among you um, so obviously I said in there that um, the King James version has those different words for worm but other translations just use worm um, so you know there are but the, the, the original um, the original word that the Hebrews used for the worm that we're interested in in Psalm 22 um, is this Taula worm, Taula at worm. Um, and uh, unfortunately I haven't got a, a picture, I, mean, I have got pictures, but 
obviously copyrights and everything, I don't want to use them because I don't want to get copyright strikes or anything and you not be able to see them anyway. So it looks a bit like a the towel out worm, this coccosilicis worm, it looks more like a grub and it sort of looks a bit like a berry on a tree, um, actually. Um, and so I think, you know, when you think about the worm, and the use of the, the word worm, um, we perceive, I think, a very negative connotation with that word, don't we? A worm, you know. Um, and I'm thinking about, there was a teaching in my church back in October, it was called Advancing Spirituality, and we were confronted with a baby's potty and asked to drink from it. Um, apparently, well, I mean, it was, in, it was a brand new potty, okay? there'd been no wee wee in it but um, obviously because of its association in your in your mind with an unclean vessel um, you know it, it causes disgust you know at the thought of that doesn't it you're not going to drink from a potty because you think Ugh, you know um, so well I'm thinking in the same way Christians find it hard to accept that Jesus in this Psalm 22 is referring to himself as a worm, you know, a disgusting worm. And, and, and we, 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 we sort of think that without asking God why. What, why are you referring to yourself as a worm, Lord? What, well, let's continue to look at it a little deeper, shall we? Okay, so now <laughs> it's getting interesting. So it's, it's the life cycle of this creature that makes it so amazing to this scripture. Okay, so stage one, the Coccus elicis lifestyle. When it's time for the mother to give birth, she attaches to a tree, branch or piece of wood and forms a hard protective shell around her body. So secure is she that you would have to rip her body apart and kill her to separate her from the tree. And of course this may bring to your mind a picture of Jesus on the cross. Of course once he's nailed to the cross there was no getting down alive. Yeah. Um, 1 Peter 2 24 says who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed that's the king james version So back to the worm. She then gives birth to her babies under the protective covering to keep them safe. The babies then feed on the living body of the mother and so she literally dies to give her children life as Jesus did to give birth to his church. Are you well, Jet? <laughs> Okay, so let's look at some more scripture. John 10, 17-18 in the KJV says, No man taketh it from me. Jesus is talking about his life here, yes? Um, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And of course we have this picture here of the mother worm literally giving her children her own body to feed on. 
to live. So if we look at Luke 22, 19 and 1 Corinthians 11, 24, Jesus says, this is my body, which is given or broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Amazing, right? Okay, let's go back in the Bible now to Capernaum, to John 6, starting at verse 25. So at this point, Jesus had just performed the feeding of the 5,000, miracle, and then they have now gone over to the other side of the lake. It says um, in John 6, 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, because you ate the loaves and had your fill. I think this is a different version to what the slides are, but anyway. Um, <laughs> do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to inter eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. This of course is a reference to what happened in Exodus when God gave Moses the miracle of manna for his people because they were starving. So they are still looking another miracle even though Jesus had literally just fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes okay let's carry on don't worry Jesus soon puts them straight um, so in John 6 32 it says Jesus said to them very truly I tell you it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven 
but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. <laughs> Still looking for miracles. So now Jesus gives it to them straight. Uh, in uh, verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. So you can't get much clearer than that, can you? Jesus is saying we have to feed on him. We are his children. Like the Taola worm, he is willing to give his life so that we may live. But to be one of his children, we must be born again under his protective covering and feed on him the living word. But they carry on grumbling and moaning and they don't understand. So he carries on and he says in verse 47, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So as you can imagine, a lot of the disciples had a tough time with this, because it sounds really strange, right? Um, if you aren't living on him, and you haven't fed yourself on his word and absorbed it into your body, if you're a true Jew, you would know Psalm 22 and understand the remez the hidden message of the Tower of Worm that was embedded in it. In their culture and their religion, it says the next in John 6, 60, that on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? But of course, when you look at it in the light of this remez, this hidden prophetic picture in the one word of the scarlet worm in Psalm 22, God had revealed that this indeed was the very act that Jesus had to fulfill. And we need to feed on Jesus, on the living word. So, yeah, if that isn't amazing enough, I'm not finished yet. That's only the first stage in the Scarlet Worm's life cycle. So now we'll go to stage two. Okay, getting really exciting now. Okay, so stage two of this Coccus alysis uh, life cycle. As the mother dies, she excretes a crimson colored dye that stains the wood and the babies for life. The crimson or scolored, this 
crimson or scarlet coloured dye made from the Ta'ala worm is a blood red colour and was traditionally used by the Jewish priests to dye the cover for the tabernacle, their robes and also a ceremonial crimson thread that was tied around the temple column and a ceremonial scapegoat during the festival of Yom Kippur or Day of Atonement. Also the worm is used to make an antibacterial agent that was traditionally used by the priests during the ceremonial cleansing rituals during the festival of Yom Kippur. As we can see in Leviticus 16.30 for in that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. One John one nine says, "If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness." The atonement was made by the priest by sacrificing an animal and by using this antibacterial agent to ceremonially cleanse the unclean, made from the towel or worm. Now, the cleansing is directly through the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, 12 to 14 says, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. So let me just add here at this point that it says in Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So it's all about Jesus. He paid a debt on the cross that he didn't owe to us, to give us eternal life in him, his children, hidden under his protective covering. Um, Isaiah 53 5 says it all, that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Okay, so now we are at stage three of the Cocos Elysis life cycle. So about three days after the mother dies, she turns a snow white colour and her tail curls up to her head making a heart shape. 
she now looks like a piece of wool and she flakes off and falls to the ground like snow which makes me think of the manna that was given by God to the Israelites in the desert to eat but also of course after three days sound familiar a few scriptures now spring to mind Isaiah 1 18 come now let us reason together saith the Lord Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Um, so Jesus rose after three days. If you want reference, you can have Acts 10.40. But I have to say, I typed in after three days into BibleGateway.com and there was tons of references, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament too, uh, for after three days. So that could be an interesting Bible study for sure. Um, so remember that this, this Taula Apt or Cocos Alicis worm was used to make the crimson coloured dye that was used for the tabernacle covering, yes. Well, the white substance is also traditionally used to make a wood preservative seal, like a white wax. And this may spring to mind Psalm 22 14. I am poured out like water, and my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, which is melted in the midst of my bowels within me. Quite a picture, eh? So you've got in that one scripture wax, you've got the image of wax and you've got the image of the heart, Jesus' heart. Um, are your minds officially blown? Because I know mine was. <laughs> I mean, don't you think it's incredible? So anyway, next time you read about worms in the Bible, have a think about what the context of that worm is referring to. So what the Rimar worms, the maggots, the canker worms, etc. They take away or destroy. Remember that the crimson worm, Jesus, will restore. Okay, so now you can see just how amazing God's Word is, just in this one little teasing glimpse of the promise of his love through this little worm, the Tawala, the Crimson Worm, of Coccus Alyssus. And by the way, Coccus Alyssus, <laughs> in Latin, it means finished. So there you are. John 19, 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Cool, huh? Um, I'm going to end in, in a prayer and uh, I just want to say Lord I thank you so much for your, your amazing tremendous love in this act that you of self-sacrifice that you Lord you, you literally want us to be under your protective covering to feed on you um, it's through you it's through you that we are forgiven and come to eternal life with you and I just 
thank you Lord for just bringing this to my attention because I'm just so blown away by your word and by your promise all your promises um, I'm just I'm, I'm blown away and I, and I, and I, I pray that whoever watches this little video I mean it's, I know it's quite long now but um, whoever watches this will be just as blessed as I feel I am through this message because for sure this is I think it's a profound message and I think the times that we're in as well this this uh, this Easter and with, with the everything that's going on in the world with this um, weird virus you know to me it just it just it just brings such a message of love and hope that if, if we come to him believe in him believe in Jesus he will be our covering and our protection and we can feed on him you know we don't have to do anything except feed on him and um, just believe that he's done it he's finished we don't have to do anything else okay, there's no, no works to be done here you just have to accept this beautiful loving gift that the Heavenly Father has given us through his son this Easter that's all you have to do Okay, and I hope that this blessed you. Um, please, if you liked it, please like and subscribe um, and share. You know, share with others if you think this is an amazing message, which I think it is. Thank you and God bless you all. Happy Easter.